Welcome back to the class. Uh, we are beginning the tenth week of uh, these lectures, and um, another uh, two more, three more weeks to go, including this tenth uh, week. So um, I have kind of with the previous class, especially with the previous week, I have concluded the uh, you know the discussions on the theoretical uh, aspects of globalization. Uh, especially, I hope you remember that in the previous week. we looked at uh, quite a lot of uh, anti globalization movements and uh, you know imaginations about uh, alternative uh, globalizations starting with the discussion on the empire by hartan negri then we also had a discussion on uh, joseph stiglitz work on uh, discontents on globalization then we had the two general classes or two sessions basically talking about the kind of uh, world justice movement or you know anti uh, hegemonic globalization Um, or, or the other mobilizations from below uh, to to fight against the corporate led uh, you know neoliberal forms of uh, globalization so with that uh, we have uh, covered we we have come to an end of a significant section of discussions on this particular course on globalization and the remaining 3 weeks what i have planned as per the syllabus is a more uh, pointed discussions on certain substantive themes so in the very beginning of this class of the course itself i had made it uh, clear that um, you know globalization is such a broad and vast topic that uh, there's hardly anything which uh, uh, we can uh, point out which is not been affected by globalization so in the given social science literature especially sociology literature as well, as well there has been enormous amount of <coughs> literature that uh, touches upon the influence of globalization on different substantive themes like say education or religion or terrorism or corruption or uh, you know you you name it any important uh, fields uh, in in the society so in this week as well as in the next week and maybe a couple of more sessions in the last week i'm going to discuss uh, several of the important specific themes substantive themes related with globalization so for example i'm going to discuss uh, two uh discuss uh, about globalization and environment in this class and the next class i'm going to discuss about uh, media and culture global culture and later i will discuss about uh, globalization and sexuality globalization and uh, religion globalization and and a number of other related themes so uh, i hope that these discussions will really help you to have some uh, you know broad understanding about the kind of literature the kind of theoretical orientation that this discipline has developed over these uh, years at the same time uh, you know that it's uh, kind of not possible for uh, anybody to uh, cover any substantive uh, discussions on each one of these themes uh, in a given uh, period in time in, in a very very short period that we have at our disposal so uh, please consider these as kind of very broad and general uh, kind of discussions on on each themes and i would really uh, encourage you to uh you know read more and uh, develop your own interest in the substantive themes because all of them are quite uh, fascinating so you if you want to develop your own interest and uh, you know expertise in in specific areas you need to really read more now uh, in this session we are uh, discussing globalization and the environment and i basically uh, uh, you know depending upon the essay written by the, with the same name by steve yali Uh, from the book uh, globalization reader one of our main textbooks edited by george richer so uh, he uh, he begins his uh, discussion with the observation that um, environment has always been global it's a very very interesting um, argument that uh, you know the environment is something that uh, uh, you know is is not something uh, confined to any particular society any particular nation state even 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 in the colonial even in the modern era or in the even pre modern era environment when you are talking about the atmosphere when you are talking about the forest or rivers or oceans they hardly obey any any natural uh, you know any any nation state boundaries and of course nation state boundaries have come into existence by having very specific negotiations with this geographical or physical uh, barriers but otherwise environment is global by by nature so that itself uh you know puts forward very interesting discussion very interesting uh, you know points of view about the relationship between globalization and uh, uh, and environment uh, something that always has been global from from the very uh, beginning 
So we are not uh, going to have a uh, you know uh, elaborate discussion about when did uh, kind of a global uh, sorry environmental consciousness began to uh, develop because that that becomes too much uh, a difficult task because many of we can say that many of your ancient scriptures ancient writings have glimpses of this environmental consciousness people being conscious about uh, environment but we are not going into in into that kind of an analysis because that's not what is our uh, main uh, agenda but uh, let uh, he uh, early uh, sees that or argues that the initial writings in the late 1980s and 1990s tended to overlook the environment as an area of globalization especially this is within sociology because sociology uh, did not or it was so sociology took lot more time to recognize uh, environment as a as a uh, highly specialized or substantive theme for exploration in comparison with say uh, social sociological preoccupation with uh, marriage or family or uh, religion or caste or conflict or or, or or education or other things because these are more kind of considered to be examples of social interaction where people interact with each other but uh, environment was seen as a non human other non human participant which was not really brought under uh, the a, a kind of sociological uh, specialization but i also must say that now environmental sociology is a highly developed uh, discipline now with with uh, several scholars and you know a lot of journals on that so so the interaction between human beings and uh, uh, and uh, environment has been uh, explored uh, thoroughly and it's a very very fascinating area of uh, study so by the middle of middle 1990s it was apparent that outside of sociology texts the environmental movements had made solid progress in appropriating imaginary and language of the global for itself because by 1990s we have uh, seen uh, quite a lot of uh, you know uh, movements uh, environmental movements across the globe in in india itself we know that uh, we had chipko movement and then we had uh, the movement uh, against uh, uh, against the construction of a dam in silent valley in kerala uh, there was uh, during uh, 80s so uh, sociologists uh, were uh, you know they, they 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 were for a root shock to realize that Uh, environment has become a kind of a important uh, point of discussion among people and people have started you know mobilizing themselves uh, raising very interesting set of demands and slogans which were not kind of familiar with and that and and that it it really requires a sociological uh, analysis so uh, so environment uh, in general uh, by in itself was not an area that were found of by sociologists but later they were forced to make sense of that so during the 90s uh, in the wake of this uh, earth summit of 1992 in rio de janeiro there emerged the language of global environmental problem so uh, maybe if you were to uh, look at one specific incident or one specific instance that has uh, given to a kind of uh, uh, impetus to this whole globalization uh, movements on environment we can we can confidently say that it was this earth summit in 1992 held in rio de janeiro in in brazil where uh, this whole uh, global environmental problems was uh, forefronted because uh, environmental problems are no longer confined to any particular nation state rather it has to be seen as a kind of a global one so the environmental movements and environmental policy prescriptions which had hitherto typically focused on national or regional and needs were now rethought as specifically global and this is the most important point that we need to come to uh, account uh, come to take into account you know uh, the environmental issues as for example pollution industrial pollution has been an issue for past several uh, decades the kind of uh, uh, you know effluents and the kind of uh, chemical pollutants that are uh, coming out of the of the of 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 the uh, big factories the way in which the solid waste disposal is being handled by the uh, municipalities or by the towns the whole question of pollution of uh, the rivers these are all nothing new they are not uh, something invented during 1990s or or later they were all issues but they were all seen as the headaches of nation states they were all seen as national problems and the rulers of each country are supposed to find solution to that and that is why how you had uh, you have had examples of you know this national uh, level policy formulations about waste disposal or urban planning or drainage system or sewage system all these things have a much much longer history but 
what we are seeing is a very interesting scenario where the, the there is an important argument which is made out that uh, many of these uh, environmental issues are no longer national problems but they have become transnational problems they have become transnational problems and uh, they require attention from everybody in the globe and they also require more collaborative effort they require more collaborative effort at the global level in order to meet those challenges so this whole uh, idea of of uh, uh, environmental uh, issues as national or regional regional needs were very significantly rethought during this particular time and one of the uh, two of the most important uh, you know issues that uh, the author uh, highlights which really provide so much of impetus for this discussion is one is this ozone layer depletion and second one is this global climate change so uh, i don't think that we need to really discuss more about uh, these two uh, issues one is this uh, ozone depletion because uh, we we uh, ozone is a, is considered to be a very inert gas which which doesn't really you know react with each other it was it is not poisonous uh, so it it's not uh, it's it's an inert one it doesn't really get into reaction with others so so we have been uh, we we have been we we know uh, you know ozone uh, for for a long time only much later that we realized that uh, a, a host of uh, you know chemicals that we use uh, in our industrial uh, uh, areas have the ability to fly up and then destroy the ozone layer and uh, that destruction has already caused so much of depletion of ozone layer uh, in the atmosphere and uh, and and and, uh, and and as a result a very harmful rays can directly enter into earth's atmosphere with with quite a lot of uh, disastrous uh, effects so this whole uh, idea about uh, ozone uh, depletion came as a rude shock for uh, scientists and, and and activists and uh, immediately very soon they uh, identified that uh, some of the chemicals like uh, chlorofluorocarbon cfc which is uh, most often used in, in in as as a refrigerant Uh, which was considered to be a safe uh, chemical is one of the very important uh, uh, sources of this uh, ozone uh, depletion so there was very frantic uh, efforts to uh, uh, to to use alternatives for uh, cfc but uh, we know that it it's not something which can you can uh, you know you can stop all on a sudden because uh, already uh, tons and tons of uh, of of such kind of chemicals are already uh, released to the uh, atmosphere and also there are illegal trades of of these such chemicals which which continue to get released into the atmosphere a second one is this uh, global climate change what we understand it as this uh, greenhouse effect with the more and more amount of carbon dioxide that is released into the uh, air uh, through all kind of burnings of various kind of fuels and that uh, increases the amount of carbon dioxide within the atmosphere and that uh, increases the temperature and that leads to uh, quite a lot of you know unpredictable changes extreme weather conditions uh, rising of sea level as a result of the melting of uh, snow in the polar region so these uh, big global uh, events which have the uh, uh, the ability to threaten the very existence of human life or 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 uh, of, of life in general in the in the, in the planet it attracted quite a lot of uh, attention during the 1990s so at the same time uh, the kind of uh, increase that uh, people observed in terms of the trade and uh, and the kind of increased increase industries industrial activities so these were considered to be the main uh, source main reasons behind uh, this uh, kind of major threats to environmental uh, standards so a uh, global liberalization of trade and global institutions such as wto imf and meetings of g7 and g8 were seen as inimical to environmental protection so we know that uh, Uh, in, the, in the previous classes we discussed how environmental issues can or it environmental issues have been one of the most important rallying points for uh, you know activists and then the grassroots uh, level uh, uh, people uh, organizations across the globe so they started targeting uh, these uh, organizations and they started having uh, rallies and assemblies and uh, congregations in front of uh, g7 and g8 uh, meets so one of the important aspects about uh, this ozone or other things is that uh, the ozone issue as a global concern with the realization that there is very little correlation between the pollution and its effects so uh, the ozone problem came as a major uh, rude shock to most of the policy uh, you know uh, people it came as a rude shock to most of the scientists and ordinary people because it it, it, it 
in, in this case, it's become very difficult to establish a, a direct correlation between, uh, you know, a particular uh, chemical, a pollutant and its effects. Because for decades, we never knew that uh, CFCs are able to uh, create so much of ozone depletion. We never realized that. And uh, we know that uh, CFC doesn't know national boundaries. So, for example, Australia was one of the countries which, which had severe uh, issues with this ozone depletion. But it's not because Australia produced so much of CFCs. So, so it doesn't really matter who produces, uh, which country produces more and more CFCs. And uh, uh, who will, there's absolutely no connection between who produces and who gets the impact or who, who gets to suffer as a result of that. And this is something, you know, you can, uh, when we discussed Ulrich Beck, I hope you, uh, we, we discuss these uh, uh, points because, a, 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 for example, a nuclear explosion, a leak in a uh, nuclear reactor, uh, the classic case of being Chernobyl. Chernobyl nuclear uh, reaction and nuclear uh, pollution, it reached far and wide. So, we, so we began to realize that the the, 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 the the problems are not something that is manageable at the local level. Even we will not be able to really make any any correlation between, any causal connection between a particular pollutant and its uh, impact somewhere. So global warming, greenhouse effects and emission of carbon dioxide, global reasons, global repercussions. So uh, the reasons why, um, again, if you take the case of global warming, the, the increased emission of uh, carbon dioxide, who is responsible for that? And, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the increasing uh, amount of carbon dioxide, uh, it, it uh, results in so much of different uh, kind of you know, consequences, the rising sea level. So rising sea level itself, uh, you know, the, the way in which different countries are able to cope up with that, uh, it, it's very, very difficult. For example, Netherlands, a country which has uh, so, uh, say centuries of hundreds of years of experience to deal with rising sea level because uh, uh, Netherlands is always is, is already under, below the sea level. They have all the technological uh, know-how and then experience to deal with it. But an, another country like say Bangladesh or, 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 or Mali or, or Maldives, uh, simply uh, they don't have the kind of capacity uh, to deal with uh, the whole uh, issue of rising uh, sea level. So, uh, you know, it, it, it emerged that these issues are global in, in the scale and they also require global coordination basically to, 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 to deal with them. Now, at the same time, there is also very interesting discussion about how far this epithet global is useful in understanding environmental issues. Now, so does it also mean that, uh, does it also, uh, you know, indicate that uh, that everything has to be seen at the global level? Or does everything work in the global level? Does everything work in the global? Does everything uh, has to be seen in the global level? So what about the sub-global uh, levels of, 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 of scales? The nation, the regional, the, 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 the local. So are they become kind of really uh, insignificant? No. A host of uh, issues like issues of contamination of the air with the noxious chemicals including uh, acid emissions, the fouling of rivers and lakes, pollution of the marine environment, loss of natural species, deforestation and the depletion of fish stocks, all these things also have a very specific regional and uh, locus implication. Okay, they have local sources. They many, many times uh, happen uh, in, a, in a, for example, the pollution of uh, rivers and, and, and lakes, the pollution of, our, uh, of, of some of the very important rivers in India. Okay, and that is a problem specifically that happens in India and having its uh, repercussions uh, for Indians. Okay, so we don't, we can't really blame anybody else for that. Or similarly, the pollution of lakes in, in, in across our uh, major met metropolitan uh, cities. So they have, they are kind of local in its, in, in their manifestation and uh, the, their causes are need to be identified in, in the regional and in the local level and their implications are also uh, kind of uh, has to be have to be felt in the similar uh, kind of uh, regions. So uh, even though the problem is everyone's, uh, is everybody equally culpable? We're moving to another set of discussion. Okay, so one is that it's of course it's global, but then we realize that uh, this epithet of uh, global problems is not sufficient. We also need to have sub-global, uh, you know, scale uh, uh, scaling. Uh, uh, yardsticks, we need to look at the local, we need to look at the regional and also the whole question is uh, even if it's problem for everyone, 
like uh, ozone depletion or uh, greenhouse effect or or nuclear thing now how do we fix accountability how do we fix accountability uh, for this kind of a mess that we have uh, uh, come into picture is every country equally responsible for that and this is a very uh, you know very very interesting uh, you know debate especially uh, discussion debates and then uh, controversies a lot of legal complications especially in in wto negotiations uh, different countries claiming different things it's it's a, it's a very very messy uh, kind of a scenario but this whole question is important who must pay the price for that okay now most of the uh, developed countries in europe and in the america they may not be uh, you know emitting so much of uh, so much of uh, uh, poisonous gases or 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 pollutants into the air they must have moved into more cleaner forms of energy windmill or nuclear or or other thing but they had a history they have had a history of 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 being some of the most uh, important polluters of the world where rest of the world was were kind of reeling under so much of under development and poverty and similarly now uh, everybody turns against china because china is seen as a major pollutant but china's argument is this we want industrial growth and we don't really give uh, so much of uh, our priorities in, uh, is is industrial and economic growth and not that of uh, of of uh, you know uh, environmental uh, issues because they would uh, china would accuse the west of our kind of being uh, hypocritical because they have had this phase of a high amount of of pollution but now they have moved beyond that and now they are kind of preaching uh, others so this a whole question of responsibility and accountability of wealthy and industrialized countries for pollution in the past and how do we account for that and how do we account for their claim or their push their very very you know systematic campaign uh, to use clean energy sources their uh, systematic campaign uh, to stop using uh, say uh, fossil uh, fuels like diesel or coal for example coal is one of the most uh, important pollutant now how do an underdeveloped country or a developing country like india has to deal with that can we completely simply say that we will no longer use coal uh, because of this environmental concern because coal energy from the coal or energy from the hydroelectric projects uh, will be very much imperative for uh, meeting some of our basic needs where substan uh, where where a, you know substantial section of population are under uh, reeling under poverty so these kind of uh, concerns and pressures countervailing pressures uh, are are something very very present in this whole uh, argument and and uh, uh, role of the us and the disagreement over kyoto uh, you know protocol so you know that this very very important controversy about how how uh, us was reluctant to become a party to that and then finally they were forced to join but uh, still there are quite a lot of complications with that now just because an issue is global that does not mean that it is viewed as urgent or significant everywhere thus it does not take much scrutiny before these global issues come to appear less universal than much environmental and scientific discourse would uh, imply so um, even if something is seen as as globally significant okay how far the rest of the world really come to agree with that and uh, you can look into n number of, of of fields for example there are quite a lot of uh, discussions and debates about various forms of fishing what kind of nets are being used so when you when a particular country uses a particular kind of fishing net what kind of collateral damage that it does to other other, other species for example uh, some of the very endangered species get trapped in in while 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 some particular kind of fishing nets are used and those fishing nets are banned in some of the of of the developed countries but then uh, can these countries also ban the fish products that are uh, procured from by other countries using the similar kind of 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 uh, you know uh, nets fishing nets how do you uh, how do you make somebody accountable for that so these are all some of the very interesting questions and um, you you can get hundreds of examples very real time uh, you know contentions and real time uh, negotiations especially in uh, wto cases and and a host of other legal issues about how do how far uh, you will be able to uh, do this or the case of the example of use of uh, pesticides use of pesticides 
to 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 what extent somebody can use pesticides and others so this explicit goals of environmental policies may be swamped by the impacts of trade and industrial policies especially in a globalized market hazardous industries are now in the global south so uh, again we coming uh, he's uh, coming back to his whole question of uh, increasing trade uh, increasing competition for profit maximization the tendency of outsourcing work and uh, many of these uh, you know hazardous industries are now moving to the global south and especially to china especially to china and a host of other uh, you know uh, less developed countries because you simply can't have this much of hazardous and poisonous uh, you know industries in the north uh, they they simply will not allow that so you you see a, a substantive shift of of such kind of hazardous industries being relocated into uh, regions of global south and one of the classic examples is this uh, ship breaking yards ship breaking yards in india and in 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 bangladesh in alang or in uh, other places so these uh, india and bangladesh are the two most important locations of breaking the ships and none of the western uh, countries will allow that because if a huge vessel has to be broken down it becomes an hazardous job it it, uh, it uh, creates quite a lot of huge amount of waste material including asbestos and others and uh, chem and toxic chemicals and uh, they seem and, and to 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 deal with it properly to uh, to process it uh, properly uh, without causing any uh, damage to environment is a hugely expensive affair which uh, the western world doesn't have the money or patience to do with that it, it it's so costly of an, uh, an affair or the, uh, the the protection for the workers and that is why these huge vessels vessels are brought to india and in bangladesh and then here you know people with with least uh, amount of protection least concern for the environment uh, engage in, in in these things so you see uh, this environmental issues even while it's being considered as a global issue have very specific uh, you know dimension with respect to our questions of uh, relative development questions of developed nations and developing nations and others so uh, another important uh, you know connection is to uh, look at how uh, this kind of global institutions especially global trade institutions the global free trade and the reconceptualization of environmental uh, issues to what extent this uh, global uh, trade has been sensitive to this uh, 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 to this environmental concern because global trade is one of the most important uh, 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 sites of pollution whether it is uh, through uh, you know through through ships or through aeroplane or through production through distribution so uh, how they have been kind of you know uh, channelized into this whole uh, discourse on environmental protection so first is this the gart general agreement on tariffs and trade in 1947 and later it was transitioned into world trade organization in 1995 and basically this was seen as a uh, international body to take care of the whole questions of tariffs and uh, and, and and then uh, other kind of taxes so that uh, there is some kind of a level uh, playing field so that uh, no country's internal economy is uh, significantly challenged with the uh, import from others at the same time ensuring that there is a sufficient movement of uh, goods and services across the the the, the globe now uh, so uh, the environmental is so that many environmental regulations would be subjected to review and legally binding judgments by an organization that was constituted constitutionally committed uh, to the free trade and not to environmental protection per se so quite a lot of uh, cases appeared in front of wto uh, since 1990s which uh, really challenged many of these agreements on the basis of uh, environmental concern and many of these examples that i mentioned about fishing for example or uh, say the um, uh, uh, the kind of uh, consequences of deforestation in in uh, different kind of countries or the use of certain pesticides use of certain chemicals okay and if you take into the other realm about the involvement of child laborers the questions of wage uh, laborers the kind of wage that is paid to these people now all these issues are not really the core issues for a trade organization so many times the rulings given by wto uh, are kind of less sensitive to the environmental concern because wto by definition is an organization established to facilitate free trade so environmentalists have been waging a fight against uh, that 
Now, preoccupation of WTO with free trade and higher economic growth and environmental regulation as less important because WTO is not uh, an organization established to take care of the uh, of the uh, environmental issues. It's by definition, it's 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 uh, you know prime principle of its establishment is to facilitate trade. So you you can't really expect that to uh, you know foreground environmental issues at the cost of uh, its core uh, interest. So. Um, Though not an environmental organization, uh, the WTO has far-reaching implications for the environmental worldwide. Though not anti-environmental in the ways its more extreme critic uh, paints it, the WTO and associated organizations strongly influence the global environment because WTO's decisions are legally binding and uh, because many of these decisions impact the environment while being passed primarily on environmental consideration. So, this is a very important uh, section where uh, we uh, realize the role of such kind of institutional setups in deciding the environmental policies and laws and uh, regulations. So, uh, there is also another argument while uh, you know the typical environmentalist argument is that uh, this increasing trade is inimical uh, to uh, environmental protection or increasing uh, uh, capitalistic uh, advancement or bringing all countries into together, it's inimical to uh, environmental protection. There's a counter argument which says that uh, there is also argument that the commercial globalization led to environmental improvement and not deterioration. In specific ways, commercial developments and rising environmental standards go hand in hand. And this is a very interesting uh, argument that. Uh, this argument is something like, uh, it, it goes like this, that earlier there were hardly any regulations. Uh, nation states really uh, were not bothered and uh, every country was free to implement its own rules and regulations about pollutions and uh, chemicals and, and other stuff. Now, but now, now more and more institutionalized regulations have been brought into picture and that is really good for the environment. So an increasing uh, global capitalistic network is necessarily not against the interest of the uh, environment. That's There goes the argument. That means uh, more and more uh, global conventions and regulations about environment will be you know, forced upon different uh, countries and as a result there will be a general improvement uh, of safety standards and env environmental protection uh, schemes across the globe which would not have been possible if the globalization simply did not take place. And, and that's an important argument which we will have to really uh, look at more carefully. Now, because of technological development, industrial policy and environmental improvement can pull in the same direction. You don't need to really see uh, them as antithetical that uh, because uh, industrial uh, production goes, it need not uh, necessarily lead to the downfall of or downgrading of environment. And if you use uh, adequate technology, clean uh, energy, uh, both these things can go together. A very, I, I, uh, very, very interesting argument. We will have to see, but what are the other kind of uh, things that uh, come associated with that? At what cost? How? Uh, a, a number of other things. The key is to understand what globalization is. Uh, it is not just the free market and economic liberalism. Rather, it's a growth in the number of and complexity of links between people and the introduction of novel limitations on the nation state. So this is a very uh, fundamental point. I, I hope we have been discussing this point ever since the beginning of this course. So it's not simply uh, you know free market or or, or other thing, but uh, what is happening is introduction of novel limitations on the nation state, and nation states are increasingly forced to adhere to certain uh, international conventions, international uh, you know uh, treaties, uh, and and thereby accept more uh, conditionalities on themselves for the. Uh, protection and well-being of the uh, environment. So, environmental globalization reveals something much more complex than a race to the bottom. It shows also the rise of new opportunities and resources for myriad non-state actors. So, uh, it, it, the, the, the scholar, uh, the author of this paper, he, he is against a very gloomy picture that environment and globalization will not go in uh, hand in hand and it's a race to the bottom, we are losing everything, we have completely, uh, you know, poisoned the, the, the earth. So, he's far more kind of optimistic and he says that uh, it's a, there is a rise of new opportunities and resources for myriad non-state um, actors and uh, technology and science 
uh, will will come uh, in in handy for uh, restoring environment or or to make it a better uh, place a, a more livable place okay so this is a kind of uh, broad summary of this um, uh, essay and uh, please read it it's it's one of the essays of this ritzer's um, um, book globalization reader okay so we will stop here now and we'll uh, meet for the next class thank you